Rinpoche, I'm very worried about many issues facing my community, my country, and our planet, and feel that it is my responsibility as both a global citizen and practitioner of the Bodhisattva path to contribute toward overcoming these problems. However, sometimes I'm also worried that this is at odds with my Dharma practice, because I find myself not just getting upset and stressed out, but really angry and even enraged at the perpetrators of the injustice and pain our world faces. What's your advice? So, I guess it must be a sign of the times that I've been asked this question, or, uh, you know, questions along these lines a lot recently. Uh, I mean, the more and more I meet Dharma friends who take a keen interest in social issue, social engagement, and how that relates to their Dharma practice. Actually, there's so many different frontiers in which Dhamma practitioners uh, may feel drawn to engage or um, that they will feel really concerned about. But yeah, to answer your question properly, we'll focus our inquiry on not on the how or, or even what the objective aspect is, but more on the subjective aspect. You know, the, the felt sense of a Dhamma practitioner facing the issues of our world. Now, you mentioned about the Bodhisattva path, right? Yeah, the Mayana path. For those who aspire to attain full awakening as soon as possible for the sake of all sentient beings. I guess the most inspirational, the most, um, you know... Um, well-known epitome of that endeavor is Avalokiteshvara, known as Jainic in Tibetan. In Chinese, it's uh, Guan Yin, uh, the Bodhisattva of great compassion. Now, his name, or her name, it's kind of a gender fluid thing depending on the part of Asia we're in. Uh, so it means the protector who watches over us. Because he watches the suffering of the whole universe all the time, without even blinking. Now his resolve to save, to free all sentient beings never wavers. And he never stops holding all of them in his oceanic compassion. And the idea we're inspired to emulate here is that we can face the world. We can face the suffering, the issues of our world, and bring it on, and bring it all on. But with love and understanding, as an untainted vision for transformation. But however, yeah, I, uh, I really, I, I get your concerns, I really do. And I don't want to shame any of my Dhamma friends for feeling what they're feeling. Because, you know, the other day, um, I was talking with a Dhamma friend, a Dhamma friend who was talking about an issue that he felt really strongly about. He was saying all these things like, oh, it's not right, so of course I'm going to get angry about it. And if I didn't get angry about it, I wouldn't work so hard to change it. If the cause is right, isn't it justified? Like, can it be um, like a pure energy like the wrathful deities have? And so what, suddenly what, you're Makala now? You know, hold the front page. So let's back it up, you know. Now, a bodhisattva, see, a bodhisattva is always prepared, is one who is prepared to strive for inconceivable duration, you know, leaping over hurdles no matter how high they are to achieve their goals. And although, you know, it's, yeah, it's based on an aspiration, it has to be acted on by engaging. So that's why we talk about the two bodhicittas. Aspiring bodhicitta and entering bodhicitta. And it's not something that we're going to get perfect just like that. You know, so... Um, things like, you know, um, obstacles, stressing out, 
rage, doubt, or whatever, they will pop up. I mean, we're not Buddhas yet. So, along the way, these are the obstacles, the inner obstacles that we're going to uh, process and that we're going to purify. And just like the cause for accomplishing our goals in Dharma is compassion, so with any obstacles, any obstacles that we look at in our world and want to work towards transforming, the key is compassion. So in this regard, um, there's a practice, a short text by the Buddha that I feel, that I find very inspiring. It's called The Aspiration for Success. And that's what we're after, right? And so in the first verse, it sets, you know, the determination that we need to um, overcome the suffering of all sentient beings. And for that, in order to do so, um, we need to be free. We need to be free from our own afflictive emotions, which are the cause. See, just dealing with the results of our, you know, our uh, collective karma is not enough. That's why as Dhamma practitioners, we, you know, we try to get to the root of our suffering. You know, if we focus on, if we just focus on the results, then we will never get to the roots of our suffering and we will lack the resources of, you know, for preventing the afflictive emotions. Uh, the afflictive emotions which are, you know, they don't just compound our suffering, but they also, um, you know, they, they, uh, they cloud our perspective. I mean, same, same thing. If we only focus on the causes and just ignore the results, well, you know, that, that, would, that would not be compatible with the cultivation of great compassion, would it? Because we will be shutting our eyes to the sorrows of the world. Now, that's, see, that's not what bodhisattvas do. And in the second verse, the Buddha says, Therefore, we generate bodhicitta. Now, what I personally love about this prayer, this um, practice, is that the Buddha gives us, you know, such powerful words for, you know, generating aspiring bodhicitta. And it, you know, it says over here, for all impoverished sentient beings, may I always be the refuge, the protector of the defenseless, the support for the unsupported. May I be the refuge for those without a refuge. May I bring bliss to those who suffer. May, and may I allay the afflictions of all sentient beings. And next, he gives us words for engaging bodhicitta, you know, engaging bodhicitta to benefit the world in, well, whatever way we can through our assiduous um, endeavor in the six transcendent perfections. And we have got a great line here. Any little thing that can make a difference. Now it's not just it's not just anger that gets in the way of our success. Actually, there are six of them. Six, um, six discordant factors to engaging bodhicitta. So of the six of them, the first is avarice um, um, or stinginess. It's a uh, it's the selfish habit when the heart hasn't had the chance to open up properly in that um, inhibits the joy of generosity. And the second is lax behavior, um, which is when we, you know, when we compromise our ethical commitment and in turn, you know, which aggravates the negative, negative karmic uh, consequences 
uh, including being wrecked with guilt, anxiety, and so on. And third, um, anger is not quite the word, actually. Uh, it's actually aggression. You see, aggression uh, can sometimes be, um, what's the word, um, you know, it can be amorphous. Yeah, it can be amorphous. Uh, a general sense of overriding negativity that it might be averse to an object uh, that is um, quite vague. You know, anger, see, whereas anger tends to be directed ill will. Uh, whether the object is on the outside or uh, is an internalized sense. So it's the opposite of patience, which is not about being passive or being indifferent, but it's about, you know, it, but determined due to the willingness to be with and to deal with the stuff that's hard to deal with. Yeah, so fourth is um, laziness. It's, um, it's when, you know, our, um, it's when our positive feeling, you know, our enthusiasm uh, for the good that we're focused on is clouded over by habituation with superficial garbage, by you know uh, procrastinations and uh, feeling disheartened and so on. Fifth is a lack of focus. It's when our minds are wandering all over the place with distractions and so on uh, that prevents from you know us uh, unifying the, you know, the special insight, the calm abiding and special insight meditation, uh, which is crucial for our awakening. And then sixth, finally, uh, the sixth one is lacks awareness. Uh, lacks awareness, which means that um, when, when we cling to fixed views, and get caught up in confusion because the light of wisdom is held back is held back from fully illuminating in our hearts so yeah okay now on the one side we might think whoa so it's not just anger there's all these other stuff that, gotta, that we gotta worry about but on the other side we can look at it from a from a positive angle that although there are all these six discordant factors and so on, but there's just one simple but extraordinary uh, force that we gotta focus on to succeed in our goals. Compassion. So, afflictive emotions like aggression and so on, they're, they're just that, afflictive rattling, disturbing, and so on. So, in, in the prayer, the Buddha says, by calming on myself from within, I must meditate with single-pointed resolution. But, well, does that mean that meditation means we should avoid giving a, a moment's thought of the problems that's going on in the world? I don't think so. No, see, we can run away as much as we want. We can run away up to a cave in the Himalayas or to a, into a jungle in the deepest, darkest Peru and to meditate in solitude as much as we want. But we cannot run away from our karma. Even, you know, even if we avoid disturbances as much as we can and, you know, only keep company with people who are uh, as sweet and fluffy as cotton candy, there will always be something. Something that eventually, you know, tests our tranquility. So, although, yeah, it's, I mean, it's totally necessary to utilize and enjoy solitude to develop uh, our meditation practice. And as the Buddha said in this prayer, he says, 
we must calm ourselves from within. Now, not from reliance on uh, external conditions. So yeah, um, although I'm far from an expert, but I do have faith. Faith that through our practices in the six transcendent perfections, since this will uproot both the causes and results of our, you know, the, the suffering of our world, the problems, the issues that we face in our world. And we must feel conviction. We must have confidence, the determination that we can do this and we will do this. And like, like the Buddha said, do any little thing that can make a difference. That gives me great hope. And then, you know, it's, not, it's no use beating ourselves up when uh, discordant factors arise in the mind stream. Uh, nor does it, you know, do we want to get caught up in them by, you know, trying to justify them or resigning ourselves to them as inevitable. But rather, it's about recognizing them. You know, recognizing them for what they are as adventitious defilements that are not part of the mind's true nature, which means it can be purified. So, and that's why we need the method side. You know, generosity, morality, um, patience, joyful vigor, dhyana, and wisdom. The two wings for takeoff. See, our method, our method and wisdom is the expression, is the is the engagement of our aspiration. And, you know, it all comes back down to compassion. So just like we have to support each other practically in whatever good work, when, when we're engaged in any good work to help others, just like that, we must support each other in our engaging bodhicitta. I think, you know, for any Dhamma practitioners, you know, regardless of lineage affiliations or whatever, since we're all followers of the one same Buddha, then these words by the Buddha, the aspiration for success, make for a very supportive and very powerful prayer to help us accomplish all our positive goals in accord with Dharma that we take to heart. So I hope this um, answers your question and I'll try to make uh, the translation available um, as soon as possible so everyone can benefit. Thank you.